Good morning. Thank you for waking up today to join me. I love that this gets to come on day three after we've learned a little bit about the difficulties that um, software engineering teams face with uh, finding the right people. Now we're going to talk about how to retain them a little bit more, especially if you started out as a coder and now suddenly you get to be the manager. So let's start out with like these three words that I think um, lots of developers roll their eyes at, like kindness and empathy and connection, right? And then you'd rather have me tell you about the really cool thing that I built for Alexa, but instead today we get to talk about what is the most important thing you will run into in your career, and that is where your mind is at as you become a leader, okay? Let's talk about you. So I'm gonna safely assume that everybody is here in the room in this mastermind conference because you are some sort of a recognized member in your field. Um, we're gonna say that you're awesome. Can we all agree on that, all right? We yeah, all agree. All right, you are competent and worthy of being here, right? Do you actually remember how you felt when, it, when, you, act, when you began in the beginning? Hmm? Some of us remember very well, because it wasn't that long ago. But some of us have also done this for 20 plus years. What I've discovered is that oftentimes the meeting of a master to a brand new uh, junior person is the most fantastic exchange I think I've ever witnessed. It's often uh, met with a lot of frustration because nobody knows how to communicate. I kind of liken it to when I go abroad and I'm desperately trying to communicate to somebody in a different language. Now, even though we speak the same audible language, we don't speak the same language uh, in, in any other way. <laughs> so I find that oftentimes, if things aren't going well in a dev team, maybe it has less to do with how competent they are and more to do with your communication style, okay? So do you just come back with me and remember what it was like to be the kid who was just trying to figure out a new concept without any context. You had no context to build on. You're just like, here's the thing. Uh, the hours you would spend trying to decipher whatever program, whatever kind of um, concept programming even was, what does it mean to do it? For me, it was trying to write console apps. I don't know what it was for you guys. It might have been different. You began to wonder if your brain even had enough space to figure it out, okay? And they figured it out. Yay. <laughs> this is what we call the God moment. I'm a God, yes. Right? I love this moment. This was the moment I fell in love with programming. Because I made something out of literally nothing. Right? That's when I fell in love with this. Oftentimes, we forget that moment of inspiration, that moment of that aha moment. And then we transition to being somewhat valuable to a company so they can give us money. And they throw us into a team of which we have not really done anything with because this is not something that they teach you in college. This is not something that they teach you in boot camp. You just get to discover it all on your own. Remember that? And then you become a little bit more valuable. <laughs> and this is the long stretch. This is the journeyman stretch, where you get to be mid-level developer for seemingly ever. It feels like it just takes a long time to get to where um, you're trusted enough to start to run with things, but you're also dangerous enough to screw things up, right? Right in the middle. But then you kind of get it. Then you get that wonderful title, you're a senior something. Senior engineer, senior UX developer, senior something, right? The, I, want, I don't want to say it's the moment it happens, but roughly like around the one, two year, two year mark, it's be, meeting a senior developer is like meeting a vegan or a CrossFit person. Like you don't have to ask them. They will tell you that they are a senior engineer. They'll tell you because rightly so, they're proud of where they got, how they got there. Some of us get that title before we're ready and feel like we didn't deserve it, right? It just happened. So let's talk about what it means to get to this stage, to this successful stage, okay? This is the one where you, you, there's two camps of people, the people who want to stay doing and the people who still want to grow and do seemingly more important things, okay? Oftentimes, companies don't give you a choice. They're like, if you want to make more money, guess what you have to transition to? Management. That's what it is. You don't get a choice. Some of us want that choice, 
We're like, yes, I've seen the movies. I want to be the coach. Let's go. Um, but being successful isn't always the best way to relate to a team. Because sometimes if you got there quite easily, it's difficult for you to explain how you got there, right? The fact is that results are the only thing that matters in our industry. Sorry to break it to you. But I'm not valuable unless I ship code. That is the definition of my role, okay? But in order for the results to even happen, this requires specific behavior on your part, right? And humans are not robots. Last time I checked, sometimes I wonder. Uh, and we cannot be programmed as easily. So since we have emotions that dictate our behavior, we kind of have to approach this algorithmically in a way. Because I find that talking in that way with other engineers that are becoming leaders is much easier than saying, hey, you who doesn't like emotion, feel things now and give empathy and stuff. You're like, what, what does that even mean? You know, especially if you got into coding to get away from people. Surprise, surprise. I'm an introvert that retired from being in the hospitality industry because I couldn't stand people anymore. <laughs> Unfortunately, here I am. <laughs> and now I spend most of my time with people and code. So let's say you get that promotion. Congratulations, you made it. Yay, you made it. Okay. This is one of the best quotes I think I've ever read, that people buy into the leader before they buy into the vision. I, I love the concept of this because you probably have met somebody that really inspired you as like an architect, right? Or somebody that you specifically went to a company to work with because you really loved the way they approached their engineering problems or you liked working with them, right? Even if you don't have control and that person didn't have control in the company, you wanted to work with them because they had a vision they, for how things should be. You want to be that person. What happens if you're not a people person, but you have to be that person? Mm. The good news is leadership is a muscle. When I first started working out in earnest with an actual trainer and not injuring myself in the gym, <clears throat> I discovered um, that the way in which he taught me was interesting. He would set things up, you know, gradually, you know, which just sounds normal, you know, throughout the course of several weeks. And then one day, he just dropped the weight down that I was using to lift, like by at least half. And I didn't understand why he was doing that. I figured that maybe my form was off and he wanted to see me do it better. And <clears throat> I kind of felt like, why are you... Am I that weak? Do you have to drop things down? He's like, no. Just do it and tell me how it went. So I did it, and I said, okay, I did it. He's like, how did it go? He's, and I'm like, well, it, I was lifting weights. It wasn't a big deal. He's like, right. Do you see how far you've come? And I never forgot that lesson. We don't see how far we come because we're always pushing our leadership muscle the next part because we should. But if you don't once in a while have somebody that drops that weight down for you or takes it off your shoulders and, and says, hey, turn around. See how far up that mountain you climbed? Remember that. What developers want from leaders is to, uh, several things. So we're gonna go through a couple of them. Because when you feel safe, the natural reaction is trust and cooperation, okay? This is all natural. We're all gonna plan this as if this is a, you know, something to file away in the building the program of you as a technical leader, okay? When we don't fear our leaders at all, then we will combine our talents and we will face the challenges that come from the outside of the team. Good leaders <clears throat> need to make their people feel safe and this is the very first thing you need to tackle. None of the rest of what I'm gonna talk about is possible unless people feel safe around you. That means they're safe to fail they are safe to confide in you, and they are safe to b believe in you. That they don't feel judged for any part of that. They also want a leader that has vision and a higher purpose for their work. Now, that sounds really lofty, but it doesn't have to be that lofty. For example, I worked for a leader that really just wanted us to be 1% better every quarter and tell us what that 1% is. Like, what did you learn that made you better 
like in a repeatable fashion, not, hey, I learned a specific framework, but what made you a better de- engineer in general? Just 1%, just like tiny bit, because I'm sure the number was arbitrary. He just wanted it to seem small enough that you still went for it. Make sense? You have to believe in a mission for the team above and beyond work, because if you don't actually believe in it, people can tell, and they won't follow you, right? You have to kind of inspire others to the calling. If that calling is clean code, if that calling is um, being a better, um, like, mob, you know, development team, whatever it is, find what that calling is. And this is outside of the project you're doing. This just has to do with what does engineering even mean to your team? And start there, and that's why people stay. You have to provide education for these things. Like, I didn't have any idea what it really meant to do true pair programming until I finally just went through a course of, like, how it should be structured. And then uh, I was like, oh, okay, maybe it's not so bad. Um, Spoiler alert, it was bad. So, like, it was, I mean, I don't like people, right? I like, just let me just sit in my corner and code. Like, let me just do that. What's interesting is that he still provided me other educational opportunities to learn how to do it in different ways. So he supported his vision, but he also acknowledged my feelings on it and went from there. Just provide opportunities and growth for the individuals on your team. What they also want are flexible and people who are empathetic to them during personal challenges. This is difficult because a lot of times you're not allowed in a company to ask or know what it is someone's going through personally, right? This was uh, particularly a big challenge in the last company I worked in, Um, but my leader did a really good job of not asking me too many questions and just providing support in an anonymous way. He's like, well, whatever's going on, know that I'm here. You just have to tell me what you need. Like, if you don't know what you need, let's just sit down and figure out what is it that you need that's different, okay? If you have hard times in your family, would you consider firing them? I mean, maybe, but I don't know how your relationship with your family. <laughs> but think twice about what's really going on in someone's life and why their performance takes a nosedive, okay? Never sacrifice people to save the numbers, which is an interesting perspective. I'm not speaking from the financial or CEO aspect. I'm speaking from a technical leader aspect. It's not your job to deal with the money. It's your job to deal with the talent of your team. Okay, that's your job. All right. They will notice and reciprocate. Okay, that's really important to do. So don't have super hard and fast rules. You know, make sure you try to put people for whatever kinds of minuscule profits you will get just from like um, making people work overtime in a constant fashion. Okay. Start with listening. A leader doesn't need to have the first word, the last word, or any of the words in between. It's quite possible to lead without doing a lot of talking. (laughs) Surprise. One of the most effective leaders I've ever had in my life was just very, very good at listening to what I wanted to do, what I wanted to become, which was, I don't know what I want to do. I don't know where I want to go or or who I want to become. But by just listening and asking one or two questions, Um, it kind of was revealed to me instead of forced down my throat, okay? Many times devs just need to vent, dude. Just let them vent. Sometimes they just need that. It's okay to just start with listening. Then move on to the respect part. This one's a little bit more difficult, especially if you spent a lot of time in the senior dev role and and maybe an architect role, and now you have to try again to remember what it's like to be a junior engineer or a mid-level and you become very impatient with their lack of speed in their job or their lack of um, aha moments, for example. Start with respecting those differences instead of the temptation of telling them that they're wrong. I know, I know, I know it's tempting when they're just straight out wrong, but there is a reason that a developer thinks the way that they think and do what they do. So if you start with respecting the way they bring that to the table, instead of forcing them into a specific ideal of what you think a developer is, that really goes a long way to making more diverse products as well. And of course, encourage. Now, not everyone is a natural born cheerleader, 
okay? That's all right. You don't have to be. Because remember, this is a muscle, right? We're building a muscle. This is the muscle of encouragement. Uh, this is the one I probably spent the most amount of time with the last developers that I w work with that were wanting to become leaders, the most time teaching them how to encourage people. They're like, well, I don't want to sound like a Sesame Street character who's always like, good job, go you. It's like, it feels weird. And I'm just not that person, you know? Being a successful encourager means believing in the ability that the developer has to overcome their obstacles, okay? So when they don't believe in it themselves, you have to show them the potential that they do have. Sometimes that means giving them something that's just an inch out of their reach and then reassuring them and giving them resources on the side, knowing full well that they could psych themselves out into literally not doing it. That was another talk for another time. Ask me later. <laughs> and it's, it's definitely one of those things that you don't have to do super loudly, but the louder the better, that's great. I'm not the kind of person that likes being like, called out into the spotlight when I do something good, like I hated birthdays, going to uh, you know, a restaurant and then coming to sing, dis disliked it. And uh, so sometimes people don't like the, you know, the encouragement out loud. Um, sometimes it's more meaningful in your one-on-ones, which you should always be having, right? Always be having your one-on-ones. When you, <coughs> when you recognize, understand that statistically, and this has been said many, many times, but just in case you didn't know, hiring importance on the list surveyed between all employees than even compensation is more that they feel like they're starved of recognition of the work that they've done. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean work that's above and beyond what they've done. They just don't even know if they're on the right path because you still haven't told them that they're doing the right thing. Okay? This is often overlooked because you figure they're like, well, they still have a job, so clearly they're doing a good job. <laughs> but, uh, don't overlook this thing saying, yes, you met this. No, you did it. Whatever it is. And this is something that should be done incrementally, not once a year in that nice, scary review process. The review process should not be a surprise to anyone. You should have already had all those conversations leading up to that review, and it's only a formality for the company. Everybody should already know what's going on. We spend, on average, as much time with our coworkers as our family members. So would you never tell your sister that she did a good job on her presentation? No. Right. You need to empower people. Delegation is really key here. This is where a lot of people fall on their face. They're like, I'm the leader now. I do all the things. Everybody follow me. And they forget to delegate some first officers, some lieutenants. They forget that, <laughs> right? <clears throat> Your team can step up to the plate, but only if you offer the plate. <laughs> you can't just stand on it yourself the whole time and be pitching the home runs, right? They, every person will have a different level of confidence here. And many need continuous reminders that they, need, that they don't need permission to go with their gut and solve a problem or create an idea. So sometimes you just got to kind of give them a little shove. This is the Parthenon. It's pretty cool. Take the picture myself. It was built in 447 BC in Athens, Greece. I had the privilege of visiting this incredible structure this summer. When you look at it, even if it's in its state of disrepair, it appears to have perfectly straight columns, identical ones that hold it up. Although, you know, over the years, time has not been completely kind to it, wars and such. So if you look at a schematic of it, it kind of looks like this. It's all an optical illusion, do you see? In order for it to appear straight from a distance, each disc that stacks up upon one another tapers slightly inward and get slightly smaller towards the top. See this? Making that the order they are stacked in incredibly important to reach that appearance. Now, not only is every disc stacked just so, because of the uneven ground that this was on, every disc was millimeters different in order to reach a completely flat roof. So that meant that every single disc is unique to a specific column in a specific area. That's how amazing dev teams are built. You cannot just swap out a mid-level developer for another mid-level developer and expect it to just fit perfectly. You built a team for a specific reason, like a family, right? 
There's unique attention required for that individual in order for them to give them a place that is right for their talents and where they are and their mindset. We have to celebrate those millimeter differences that we have because we're not going to get to that perfectly flat roof together unless we have those slight differences, sometimes bigger differences. Notice how they support each other. That brings me to the care of junior developers. This is called the care and feeding of software engineers. We're gonna go through what it means in a role. Remember, everything you need to know as a junior developer, you knew as a kid. Remember that back then? Show them how by demonstrating tasks and staying nearby to guide them as they begin. You know, more for like moral support. Let them make mistakes and remind them that it happens. And keep encouraging them to find their way to the right path. Instead of being like, ooh, you totally screwed that up. Please do not phrase it that way. To be like, that is one path you took. Let's take a different one. You know, kind of like that cool, um, the, the cool like interactive fiction thing that Eric was talking about, is that you could just keep going until you find that path. Why can't we be playful with the way the junior developers learn? Think about that. <clears throat> Care of mid-level developers, they're there a little bit longer than a junior. So you need to start supporting coworkers pairing with each other, like not in specific pair programming, but just sharing some of the stuff that they've learned. Like, hey, did you know you could do this thing? So as they now contribute to more projects with consistent results, you need to kind of generate confidence by encouraging them to vocalize ideas at this stage and asking them what they think before you ask what the seniors think. That changed the game for many projects at the companies I've worked with. Is that the moment I was like, okay, we're gonna have this thing called a stand-up. Does anybody do agile programming? Yay. And so we have this thing where we get a little meeting for five minutes. Sometimes it's online, sometimes it's in person. Regardless, the leader that I really respected, admired, would always ask from the least experienced to the most experienced. Start with the one that has the least amount because I bet their perspective will surprise you. In fact, the last several species of amoeba were discovered by junior students in college, not by huge professors or experts in their field. Like, how cool is that? Because they still have that curiosity and think about things in a way where they're not completely conditioned to think a certain way, right? So that brings me to <clears throat> the senior developers. Allow them time for experimentation, please. Make sure that, um, autonomous, ta that the autonomous tasks um, are something that they get to think about, how to scale up. Those are the fun big problems that they like to choose to tackle. So have them teaching concepts, not all the time, but have them teach concepts to other developers regularly and showcase the research they've done on their own because what you're doing now is that, that they understand their craft pretty well is how to communicate their craft. That's not something that they go to school to learn. So please, Make sure this is the part where you encourage them on the audible side of it, on the visual teaching side of it. But also, let them go off by themselves for a little bit and come back with, hey, I researched this stuff and look how cool this could also be. So let's get into the feeding of individual personalities. When I first started, uh, I went to a very um, amazing team that could honestly build anything in the world. Um, very intimidating to be part of, but there was an incredible sameness about them because the leader that hired wanted to hire carbon copies of himself. So it wasn't just like a visual thing, it was a mindset thing as well and education level. So they all had the same personality type. And then there's me, right? Which I don't think anybody has my personality, so, you know? That was really difficult for me because that leader didn't know how to feed me didn't understand how to develop me. So instead, I just felt really squashed, okay? I was the introvert, okay? Let's start with that one. <clears throat> I don't get my energy from people. I get it from quiet time alone and being thoughtful and thinking about like the next problem to solve, okay? It makes me a really tough pair programmer because <laughs> I need time to myself to think through a problem. Even if my mind is going rapidly fast, I don't like being interrupted in my thought pattern. That's really hard for me. But unfortunately, you have to be in a team, you have to get along, right? But I had to be more reflective and think deeply about problems before voicing them. 
I needed to be a lot more certain before speaking up. The value though, is that because I've had this time to reflect, oftentimes it can be a little bit more focused into the point of what we're trying to do. So that is the value that this particular type of personality provides. And there's the extrovert, fun one. This is someone who gets their spirits raised and energy restored from being with others. So they like that. They're the fun person that comes into the room. Their value is obvious in many ways is that the extrovert usually lifts the mood. Lifts the mood, um, oftentimes uh, the synergy of the team because they're the rallier. They like to rally people. Come on, let's go do a thing. Let's go out for beers, let's go do a thing. Um, or let's absolutely try this new framework. Let's go, right? They have value as well, even though they are the opposite of me. The feeding of the optimist. Huh. They're the easy ones to spot. The optimist literally looks only on the sunny side of life. And I love these people because when I meet them, they just make me smile all the time. However, the optimist needs to be balanced out with a pessimist. If your entire team is a bunch of optimists that don't realize that they could, in fact, um, not ship code just because they believe that they could, <laughs> the pessimist finds the blind spots in the situation that the others don't notice. There's value in having a pessimist on the team. So just because you may not be one doesn't mean there isn't inherent value in the way they see life. Then there's the sensitive ones. Huh. This is interesting. They'll often catch empathy for others. So they're the ones who kind of notice somebody else's mood changing or th they tend not to um, be using their regular patterns because they quietly observe a lot. They also tend to almost have a heartbeat on the way the company is doing, <laughs> you know? They just seem to get a feel for the room. Their value is obvious because if you are a leader that isn't naturally empathic, having a sensitive person on the team is often very helpful. I also played this role in the last company I worked with because I would see things that oftentimes my leader didn't. So I would just bring it up to him and he's like, oh, I didn't think about that. So there is also value in a sensitive person. And the bold people, yeah. They will always go first and they will volunteer often because they're in it. What they really need is the chance to lead or take charge, even if it's a small thing. They want it. They are hungry for it. That's just their personality. Whether they have the skill set or not, they will go for it. <coughs> and so their value is often that you can definitely throw them in front of the non-technical people and they will believe that you guys are wizards because they can sell that dream, right? And then there's the visionary people who are truly like your underling leaders in a way. They can often increase quality and focus on the true big picture of whatever you've got going on. But what they need is room to contribute. So ask them about what they think and pull them aside. So instead of pushing them in front of the room to ex express their opinion, just pull them aside and say, hey, I know you think about these kinds of things a lot. What do you think? And I would be remiss if I did not mention the downhearted people. This is not a personality type. So it could be any one of us, whether it's a moment in life that happens to every person um, or a lifelong suffering from a medical diagnosis, this is something that a leader will run into on the team. Somebody that just cannot seem to, to ever really be satisfied, happy, whatever it is. These people still have value. It may be hard because you think, I'm not a professional, you know, like I'm a therapist, I'm not their family member, I don't know how to help this person. But their value is oftentimes one of the highest skill sets. Because in order for them to reach that skill set, they had to isolate themselves from everybody else. Oftentimes, relationships suffer, etc. Okay? So in this case, this is something that I would encourage you to work with 
your HR department or whatever it is so that you don't say something as an untrained individual that can trigger them. You know, something that don't just give advice because you just want them to feel better. It's really important that you respect whatever process personally that they've got going on. But what you need to honestly do is just trust your team's judgment. You may need to step in to make decisions or priority calls, but this will be on the information that your team provided you. If you get this right, you should have a good autonomous and self-directed team. My good friend Stephen Hotz said that to me and put it down in a blog post years later. I never forgot this because my takeaways from what I've been learning about a developer turned leader is that developers are self-sacrificial. You gotta kinda watch out for them a little bit. They're not really good at making sure they're okay first before throwing themselves into a problem. That actually is something that I think is kind of amazing. That we sacrifice everything else in pursuit of building something that's useful or cool or something out of nothing, you know? Now it's your job to make sure that the people behind the programming have what they need. I know you used to do that, so you should have the most amount of empathy for what they go through. Give away your control and create opportunities for others to grow. Make sure you drive for autonomy and mastery and purpose. Allow your team to fail a bit because that's how they learn. Make sure you teach others and emphasize that you are also learning. It's okay to be a learning leader publicly. It's okay not to know everything. It's important that you understand that what rests on the shoulders of your individual contributors, you're just there to shield and protect them. I like to think about it like you are the roof of the Parthenon. You're just there to be held up by your team. They're the ones who are the solid part. They're the ones that will stand the test of time. You're there to shield them from the things that rain down on them from above in your organization and from outside of your company. You're there to protect them. They're there to be the solid piece of the architecture. So go forth and apply the new tech that you've discovered here and some of the concepts that you've learned in this mastermind and learn better ways to code. Those skills are necessary, but take care to learn how to truly nurture a team before you go out and say, I want to be the leader. You have to add human skills to your future plans as well, and it needs to be something that you add continuously. With a group of confident and cohesive developers, you can build a space station, you can build anything. So go and build your Parthenon. Thank you.